Cause my messes are all that you'll find I'll tell a story, both true and allegorial The process is precious, so it takes up all my time While Hurricane Helene disrupted virtually every life and way of life in this region, at least one thing is happening as scheduled, the 2024 election. Today, I talk with Amanda Edwards, a member of the Buncombe County Commission who is running to succeed the departing Brownie Newman as chair. I'm ready to serve Buncombe County as its leader from the moment I am sworn in as the commission chair. I don't have a learning curve of understanding the depth and breadth of county government, but really being able to pick up and continue moving the county forward. This is The Overlook with Matt Pikin, a podcast about the news, arts, issues, and trends of Asheville, North Carolina. Here, Edwards talks about her motivations for entering electoral politics and the issues that motivate her today. Our conversation runs through affordable housing policy, education, the environment, and improving emergency services. She also makes a point to talk about transparency and ethics as an elected official. I recorded this conversation with Amanda Edwards weeks before Hurricane Helene swept through our region. Also, just know later in this conversation, Edwards criticizes a now former practice of elected county officials accepting retention bonuses. Though she doesn't directly name him, her opponent in this race, Van Duncan, was an elected sheriff who accepted such a bonus. I emailed Van Duncan's campaign to interview him and didn't receive a response. I started my conversation with Edwards by asking what she was doing professionally before going into public service and to talk about that transition. My career goal was to be an NFL sideline reporter. Wow. (laughs) Really? Right? I used to be a sports writer, so that's funny. I have a huge passion for sports, particularly football. I wanted to be on the sidelines before we even knew who Aaron Andrews was or was going to be. I, however, fell into philanthropy and fundraising during my undergraduate work. I worked closely with the Office of Development, now Advancement, at UNC Asheville. And the associate vice chancellor at the time really took me under his wing and said, I think you'd be really good at this work. And I resisted until my senior year. And I said, I think you might be right. I really like this. So I graduated, moved to Knoxville, Tennessee, was the public relations and volunteer coordinator for a very tiny nonprofit called Friends of Literacy, working with adults, working toward obtaining their GED and learning English as a second language. At the very ripe age of 24, I became the executive director of that organization. And because of my age, I knew that I needed to have an advanced degree in order to be taken seriously as a professional. And I love the work of nonprofits so much that I was like, let's look at the Master's of Public Administration program at UT. And so I did. I applied and was accepted. I worked and went to school at the same time. Applied for some jobs here in Asheville in the summer of 2004. And the Literacy Council of Buncombe County, now known as Literacy Together, happened to be hiring an executive director. It was almost exactly the work that I had been doing in Knoxville. Wow. When did you think about yeah. running for public office? Now, yes. I, I know I'm Great skipping, I know I'm yeah, skipping no, no, no. some steps. You were at the EB Tech Foundation and some other things that are still active in your world. So the MPA degree, the Public Administration Master's, is the degree that city and county administrators, city can- city managers, county managers must have in order to be qualified to do their jobs. So never dreamed that I was going to run for office. Always had an interest in politics, was happy working behind the scenes on political campaigns, never wanted to be on the ballot. However, it was the summer of 2017 when the news was breaking about what was happening in Buncombe County government with the county manager, assistant county managers, And the suspicion that maybe a county commissioner had been involved in some of that as well. And my family and I were on vacation. Matt, we were in the middle of nowhere, Utah. And I look at my husband. I said, maybe I should run for a county commission. I have this MPA. I understand from a practical standpoint how government is supposed to run. So maybe I should run. And I got back. I had calls from several folks saying, we really want to talk to you about considering running for county commission. And 
I guess, as they say from there, the rest is history. So it's interesting that you had these thoughts while others seemingly had these thoughts that you should run. And you talked about when getting this MPA that it's the entryway mm-hmm. to running for office. But I also know that's a, an entryway to being a city manager right. or something, not necessarily an elected official. Those are two different things. Not necessarily two different things, but they don't have to be one and the same. Working for a city, working in a city administration or county administration and running for office. What was it about the political end of things, or at least the elected office that drew you more than being a, a, like a city manager? Matt, as we've discussed, I've spent my career serving communities, marginalized populations specifically, and leading organizations. And I felt that the skill set that I had of leading and also understanding the role of the leader of an organization versus the board who is the governance and the policy setting arm of that gave me a unique lens to run for office versus getting into the the employee route of using that MPA. I have always worked across sectors, across various political spectrums, and felt that was what was needed in Buncombe County. It was really interesting when I announced my run, that my campaign was off to a start. The number of people that I've worked with in this community over the time who said, we had no idea what your politics were. And to me, that was a positive, that it really spoke to the fact that I believed then, and even more so now that I can work across the aisle with anyone especially when you're leading and you're governing and you're serving a community, at the end of the day, it's about serving every single resident and serving the best interest of our community and our county, politics aside. And so having always operated in that very nonpartisan, unbiased manner, I think gave me an edge as an elected official that I had already established really deep relationships with people across the entire political spectrum. Did you have to adopt a certain politic or even come to terms for yourself with what your politics were in a way that you didn't have to previously? It's one thing to run a nonprofit. That's not necessarily a partisan position at all. And when you're running for office, maybe people expect you to take, it's not like running for Congress or Senate, but there is a politic to it. People want to know whether you're a progressive or you're conservative in certain ways. Did you have to own a certain politic for yourself first before even going public with anything when you ran for office? I love that question. For me personally, because it does attest to the work that I've done in our community, my goal in running for county commission in 2018 as a first-time candidate was to restore trust, accountability, and transparency to Buncombe County government. To me, that is nonpartisan and was what the county needed at the time. And I believe we are, we've addressed so much corruption and greed in Buncombe County and restoring trust. i believe we've made a lot of progress and delivered on many results of that. Can you be and specific still about more work to do? Yeah, sure. spe- be specific about some of the things you've sure. done, you and your fellow commissioners have sure. done in that time it's a to great restore trust. Question. One that I am most proud of. There's many, but there's a couple that rise to the surface. The first that I'm most proud of is we have made it illegal for elected officials to take retention bonuses. That under previous county management, there was an elected official who took a retention bonus to complete their term as an elected leader. That's that sounds like a blatant cash cow back to yourself in a way. Why? That's so self-serving. How would that even be a policy that would fly, that would get past public scrutiny? It no longer does under the leadership that I brought to Buncombe County Commission and Buncombe County government, I think it speaks to the level of corruption that was running through Buncombe County at the time where an elected leader believed that it was okay to accept a retention bonus to complete a term. When you're accountable to the voters, not the county manager, all seven Buncombe County commissioners, elected leaders are accountable to the voters not staff. So I certainly, what I will tell you, 
my personal ethics would never have allowed me to accept a retention bonus. So what I will say, I am incredibly proud of the fact that we have made it illegal for elected officials to take retention bonuses to remain in office. The second policy that I'm really proud of is we have completely changed how we fund nonprofit organizations across Buncombe County. We have a strategic plan in place across five foundational goals of Buncombe County. And we know we're a county full of nonprofit organizations who are doing work that aligns with the goals of Buncombe County government. And so the strategic partnership funding process now fully aligns with the strategic goals of Buncombe County government. Did this not happen before? Was it more piecemeal and subjective in terms of funding? What was happening before? That's a great question. So I was handed as a brand new commissioner, a spreadsheet with a list of nonprofits and what they were asking for and asked to rank them. It became madness because, of course, nonprofits who had someone working in advocacy or in fundraising knew to reach out to the county commissioners to advocate for the program they were seeking funding for. And what I saw was organizations doing incredible work that supports Buncombe County They don't have the same resources as many of those organizations. They may not have had the time to reach out to their county commissioners to advocate because they're focused on the program and serving their constituents in that organization. And it felt like absolute and complete madness and chaos and that you started advocating for the organizations that maybe had reached out to the most or had more resources to send an e-newsletter to their own supporters saying, reach out to your county commissioners to advocate for funding for us. And we were leaving really good programs that align with the goals of Buncombe County behind. So the other piece that we did away with that crazy spreadsheet, we did away with the madness of each commissioner bringing in their lens and who they wanted to ensure had funding. Because that also speaks to the way things used to be done in Buncombe County. And we created a strategic partnership committee, and it is a fully transparent committee. Their meetings are held in public for anyone to watch or attend and see how the decisions are being made. The commissioners interview and appoint representatives to serve on the strategic partnerships committee. And they are the ones who review the applications. They ask the follow-up questions. And it's part of our budget process now that the strategic partnership committee goes through that process and then they make the recommendation for the funding. And they're specifically looking at how those organizations their goals are aligning with our goals so that we can further Buncombe County in those areas that we have set as important to moving us forward. It sounds like you went into running for office to try to be transparent and clean things up, play a role in cleaning things up. It's another to want to move things forward and establish policies like you were just talking about in, in terms of how nonprofits are funded. What are some other things that you helped initiate as a county commissioner that you wouldn't have even thought about when you were running for office. It's one thing to have an impetus to run. It's another to when you're in the seat to develop some policies and processes that move things forward. What's some things that you discovered in the job that you want to push forward? The first one that comes to mind for me is our affordable housing subcommittee. Running for office really opened my eyes to the challenges that our community has in terms of affordable home ownership and affordable rentals for locals. And it was a result of that working in conjunction with Brownie Newman that we created the Affordable Housing Subcommittee to really start ushering in a new process for funding affordable housing projects. They were very haphazard at the time. They were coming to us at random times. And so we said, we really need to streamline this as part, again, of our budget process. And we have created, I think, an incredible plan working in conjunction with our affordable housing staff and our affordable housing services program, which funds affordable housing. 
The second piece of that is in 2022, voters approved not only open space bonds, but $40 million of bonds for affordable housing. And it was the groundwork that the Affordable Housing Committee laid and setting goals, some aggressive goals of reaching some affordable housing by 2030 that led us to saying we need bonds in order to really make a difference. A two to $3 million line item in the budget every year is not moving the needle forward as quickly as our constituents are telling us it needs to move. What happens with that money? So it's one thing, okay, we need affordable housing. We want to help our county or city government to move things forward right. in that way. What does the county do with this money coming in through the referendum? So the $40 million has come to Buncombe County. Let me first say we do have an oversight committee to ensure that the funding is indeed being spent in the way that we have told our constituents that it is being spent and allocated. So we do have an oversight arm for transparency and accountability with the GO bonds. What the commissioners have done, specifically the Affordable Housing Committee, is we've expanded the application process for affordable housing. So the process opens late fall, early December, and the developers apply using the goals that we've set forward, as well as using their pro forma and their budget to determine the cost per unit. Are they using low-income housing tax credits? It's a formula that is looked at. And then the staff, we have incredible staff in affordable housing and planning who review those in depth, in detail. They share every detailed application and budget with us, and we review it, and then we make funding recommendations from there. Again, we meet the first Tuesday of every month at 1 p.m., again, open meetings, so folks can see how we're deliberating and making these decisions. We have been really lucky over the past couple of years that we've got phenomenal local developers, including Mountain Housing Opportunities and Habitat for Humanity, who do just an incredible job in terms of building affordable rentals and homeownership opportunities. What this has allowed us to do, though, is bring in additional developers because we just don't have enough here to meet the needs. One of the projects I'm really excited about is through an, a developer called LDG in Louisville, Kentucky, and they are building affordable rental units in Weaverville, which is my neighborhood, I, my community. I live in Weaverville. And we've been able to look beyond just the city of Asheville for affordable housing. I hear so often, Matt, longtime residents, natives of Buncombe County saying, I need affordable housing, but I don't want to live in the city. I don't need public transportation. I don't need access to core services on a consistent basis. I have a vehicle, but I need to afford a place for my family and I to live. And I grew up in Weaverville and that's where I'd like to stay. Or I grew up in Leicester and I'd like to stay close to my community. I often say in order to address the affordable housing crisis, we have to have all kinds of housing for all kinds of people, that we have to look across the spectrum of our housing needs, that we know there's data that show that, for example, affordable homes in West Asheville are often snatched up by folks who may have more means to buy a different type of home, but that's all that's available. So we do have to ensure that we've got home ownership opportunities at all price points so that when an affordable house does come on the market, that it is available for someone that that is their price range. When you're talking about developing homes at mm -hmm. all price points, and particularly in the affordable spectrum, how can you as a county commissioner or how can the commission or city council give incentives to developers to build properties and price them at a, at a rate that attracts people who are of uh, lesser economic means and they don't get swept under by people who, who make more money right. and can pay cash for these homes. Right. How, how can you help shape the market? So that is where our affordable housing services program and the bond funding really comes into play because it allows us to fund those developers who have the opportunity to apply for the low-income housing tax credits, which is a huge component of being able to bring on more affordable housing to our area. One thing that I'm particularly excited about in terms of 
our policy ways we're addressing affordable housing outside of the bonds is we know the most expensive part of building affordable housing is land. So we took a look alongside UNC School of Government's Department of Finance initiative, all of the land that Montgomery County government owns and what could potentially be developed into housing. So working in conjunction with them, several areas were identified, additional research was done. We now have an RFP out for affordable apartments to be built on Cox Avenue right downtown. So we do know there are people who that's what they desire. They want to be downtown. We also have a large amount of property on Ferry Road where a brewery was supposed to be built. And the commission held on to that land. They said, we're just going to hold on to it. We're not going to sell it. It could not have been a better decision to hold on to that because that is the second piece of land that we will develop as a county government. And it will include rental units, single family homes, but also homes to address our missing middle price point, which is that 80 to 120% AMI that catches our teachers, our first responders, even our city and county government employees fall well within that 80 to 120% AMI. And the biggest piece of home ownership that we're missing is townhomes. You go to any city of any size, any budding town, there's home ownership opportunities in townhomes. We don't have that here. More after this. In Asheville and throughout Western North Carolina, Hurricane Helene swept away hundreds of lives, thousands of livelihoods, and countless elements that make living here so unique and special. If you're in a position to help this region recover, I'm going to direct you to two reputable organizations to send money. One is the North Carolina Disaster Relief Fund. You'll find details at nc.gov slash donate. The other is Mountain True. It will take years and many millions of dollars to restore our legendary mountains, trails, and rivers, and that work is the heart of Mountain True's mission. Learn more and donate at mountaintrue.org. Before we get to why you're running for commission yeah. chair, can you compare and contrast for people who may not dial in really closely to what the difference is between a city council and a county commission? Talk about how the county commission either co- compares, contrasts, works with city councils or works independent and what, how they decide what territory falls under the purview of a county commission versus a city council. Sure. The Buncombe County Commission covers unincorporated areas of Buncombe County. A city or a town is the municipality. So we have the city of Asheville, town of Weaverville, town of Montreat, town of Biltmore Forest, and town of Woodfin. Those are municipalities that fall within the county that we live in, as well as the town of Black Mountain. They're working within their jurisdiction to fund their core services, their municipalities, whether it's law enforcement, their public safety, trash services, whatever is falling within that municipality, that's what they're doing. We're doing that across the county, across unincorporated Buncombe. So Swannanoa falls into that Fairview. When you think about the towns in Buncombe County that don't have a municipality, that's where Buncombe County is covering. Right. We do have a budget of about a half billion dollars annually. And I think that's usually shocking to people. It falls to the county commission to fund public safety across the county. So 21% of our budget funds EMS, as well as the Buncombe County Sheriff's Office. 20% of our budget funds health and human services, which includes public health and the health department. 30%, the largest portion of Buncombe County's budget covers K-12 education. That gets to a subject I wanted to ask you about your view of the merging of school districts. I know that's come up a lot. And I've talked to uh, board members, both Asheville City Schools, who seem open to the idea, Buncombe County Schools board members also. Where do you sit on this? What frustrates me about the consolidation study, nobody asked the General Assembly to do this. I think The city schools, the county schools, the county commissioners, we were operating with a two-school system, and 
we were okay with that. It's very reminiscent of when the General Assembly came to Buncombe County government and said, we're going to put county commission in districts now, and they're going to be tied to house districts. Nobody asked for that. Nobody asked for this consolidation study. So I have concerns about why they wanted the consolidation study and why they weren't funding it if they wanted it. So the consolidation study cost has fallen to Buncombe County to fund at this point. We're hoping that they'll change their mind and, and it's pay us back. And it's imposed. They don't have a choice. They, there is no choice to, but to do this. Right. What I will say on consolidation is we have two very good school systems, Asheville City and Buncombe County Schools, that are both serving, in many ways, very different populations of students. At the end of the day, all I want to ensure is that the decision is made with the best interests of our students at the forefront of this and nothing else. You said it's two different populations of students. In some ways, aren't 15-year-olds 15-year-olds and 10-year-olds 10-year-olds? How are you distinguishing why they're two very different bodies of students? Both of our school districts do have an opportunity gap. The opportunity gap looks very different when you dig in a bit deeper. The Asheville City Schools District opportunity gap falls within students of color. And my concern, should a consolidation happen, is that our students of color are not left behind when they are in a school district who does continue to focus on working very diligently to close that opportunity gap. Do you think one district more than another has the imperative to do that, that there's just more need to do that, let's say, within Asheville City Schools than within Buncombe County Schools? I don't think I can truly answer that question. As a commissioner, I would be really interested to hear that viewpoint from our school board members and our two superintendents. Yeah. You touched on an issue that I hear permeating city operations yeah. often is that, that we're in this mother may I state that the legislature really dictates a lot of what we can and can't sure. do to a certain degree. Does that also hamstring county commission? Does the same thing that I hear from the mayor and city council members and others in city staff, does that also hamstring county commission and what you can do with your budget and can't do? It definitely hamstrings us. I have often said, and I will continue to say it, that the North Carolina General Assembly is the biggest threat to public K-12 education. They continue to not meet their constitutional mandate to fully fund K-12. And so they're pushing that further and further onto county commissions and county governments to increase funding to ensure that our schools have the bare minimum to operate, which does account for why our county budget is 30 percent dedicated to public schools. And also, I know cities, at least Asheville, the only real mechanism they have other than referendums to raise money is property taxes. Right. Can the same thing happen at county level? What can you do to raise money if the legislature is not giving more money toward public education? Property tax is the biggest lever that counties have to pull in order to fund its general fund. And that burden gets pushed onto property and homeowners. I recently said that Folks across the state of North Carolina should be angry. You're being taxed at a state level specifically for public education. And then your local county government is having to add an additional tax because the state's not funding public education. They're siphoning it off elsewhere. And so it makes the budget decisions incredibly difficult on a county when we see where there's need, when we see where we need to add additional resources, and yet the General Assembly continues to hamstring us in moving forward in many areas because we do have to fund K-12 education. I think another area where the General Assembly has really impacted county government is by dictating county commission lines. Every two years, the county commission district lines change. And it is incredibly confusing to our constituents. For example, in 2022, I was elected 
in the North Buncombe District. So Barnardsville, Weaverville, over to Sandy Mush and Lester, Woodfin. I have a little bit of West Asheville, but I have no downtown. That's the 2022 District 3. You look at the 2024 map of District 3, and it's completely different. And so our residents reach out and they're like, I, I don't even know who I'm supposed to contact as my county commissioner to get help in my particular area. I don't think that is an accident, Matt. I think that goes back to them tying the county commission districts to house districts as the General Assembly was trying to gain an advantage in Raleigh. They've proven on county commission that has not worked. And yet... They continue to redraw maps every two years is this to happen- the detriment, I think, of voters. Yeah. Is this happening statewide or are they picking on Buncombe County and Asheville? I've heard both. Buncombe County is the only county of 100 counties in North Carolina whose county commission districts are tied to its house districts. Wow. And we're only one of three, I believe it's still three, that the commission chair is elected at large by all voters. Typically, if it's a seven-member board of commissioners, the members of that board of commission elect their chair to serve maybe two years or so. We're, again, very different. Which leads to why you're running now. I know Brownie Newman had decided not to run again. You did allude to that you've worked with Brownie Newman on some policies. And can you describe your relationship, your working relationship with Brownie Newman and why you're deciding to run to succeed him? I have developed an incredible work relationship with Brownie Newman. And he has been an incredible county commission chair and leader for Buncombe County. He helped us usher in the changes that were desperately needed to bring trust, accountability, and transparency back to Buncombe County government. His leadership has changed the course of Buncombe County for the better, I believe. I was speechless when he called to tell me that he was not going to seek re-election. It takes a lot for me not to have words to say, and it took a few minutes to be able to process the brevity of Brownie Newman choosing not to run for chair again. I, at that point, had served five years on county commission, talked to some very trusted advisors as well as my family, and said, I've got service under my belt. I have experience of serving Buncombe County as a commissioner for a full term. I was well into my second term at that point and decided that I was going to seek the chair seat. And a a big piece of that for me, Matt, was that I had service as a commissioner under my belt, that I'm ready to serve Buncombe County as its leader from the moment I am sworn in as the commission chair. I don't have a learning curve of understanding the depth and breadth of county government, but really being able to pick up and continue moving the county forward in the ways that the county commission has chosen to move forward, specifically through our strategic plan. I do have four key areas as the commission chair that I do want to keep focus on, and I call them my four E's. I tell folks it's easy to remember. Edwards and her four E's. <laughs> the first is the economy. And when I talk about the economy, Matt, I talk about ensuring we have career wage jobs as well as affordable housing opportunities and high speed internet. Those all tie in together to ensuring that we have a strong economy for locals. The second is education. I am incredibly passionate about public education because we know when our K-12 students are highly educated. They go on to great educational institutions, and we hope that they'll come back to good jobs here. The third is the environment. Of course, I care deeply about land conservation, air and water quality, but I did serve as the executive director of the American Red Cross of Western North Carolina. And because of that work, it led me to see firsthand the impact of climate change. So when I talk about the environment, I'm also talking about resiliency to climate change and natural disasters and being prepared for when they come, not if they come. And my last E is emergency services. Again, that time at the Red Cross working very closely with first responders, 
and seeing the importance of the role that they play in our community, whether it's continuing to expand our community paramedics program with EMS, continuing to expand our co-responder program with the Buncombe County Sheriff's Office and Buncombe County Emergency Management. And that program ensures that the right professionals respond to the crisis at hand. Whether it is a domestic violence call, you want to make sure you have that sheriff's deputy there alongside the, the other right professionals to address domestic violence. Also, mental health crisis, substance abuse crisis. That co-responder model has had over 500 calls since its inception last fall, and only two people have had to be arrested and sent to the detention center oh. because it matters when you send the right people to the crisis. I also want to say under emergency services, it has been under my leadership as a Buncombe County commissioner that we have increased detention center pay as well as sheriff's deputies pay, which then also led to increasing paramedic pay. So I am incredibly supportive of the work of emergency services and want to continue ensuring that we're making Buncombe County a place where everyone can feel safe when they're here. You mentioned safety. I know you are running for office against Van Duncan, a former uh, Buncombe County mm -hmm. Sheriff. Uh, how do you look to distinguish yourself in this race, particularly in the public safety and emergency responder arena? Serving as the county commission chair is much broader than the role of a sheriff. And because it is broad, it's about looking at the, the bigger picture and the lens of public safety and emergency services. It goes to seeing it from a more holistic perspective of, as I've stated previously, how the Buncombe County Sheriff's Office interacts with EMS and community paramedics, how those programs interact with the detention center, how they interact with the residents who are calling 911. It's a much broader perspective than just a singular view that he brings to the table. I also bring six years of experience as a county commissioner. And again, the very in-depth understanding of county government and everything that we do. We have to look at a broader scale of our community, including public education, public health. I've learned more about the landfill and trash collection than I ever thought I would know in my entire life. So we have to look at those services as well as just a singular issue that a candidate may be running on. Are we in a, the city is a weak mayor system. You know, this, Esther Mannheimer is one of seven city council members when it comes right down to it. She can assign committee members to things and take committee members off. There's not a lot of power other than symbolism in a sense. You are the mayor, you are the center point of things. Same thing with county commission, or does the county commission chair have certain powers to bring things to the table and certain policies that maybe other commissioners don't? That's a great question, Matt. The county commission chair is the one who works most closely, I believe, with the county manager and county staff to determine not only the agenda for the meeting, but the policies and procedures that are going to be brought forward. So I do think the county commission chair in Buncombe County does have an enormous opportunity to direct the future of Buncombe County. I guess the last thing I'll ask you is you've been in office now two terms. This is would be your third term on commission. Do you have any sights on higher office? Let's say you are in county commission. You, you've still got a long career ahead of you no matter where you decide to go. What, what do you ultimately see yourself doing? I see myself winning Buncombe County commission chair on November 5th and making history as our first female county commission chair in Buncombe County history. I never intended to run for public office, and I'm looking at this singular goal in front of me right now because I want to be the very best county commission chair that I can be without thinking about what's next. I'd like to thank Amanda Edwards for taking the time to talk with me along the campaign trail. Our conversation took place at the BB Theater in downtown Asheville, which comes to me courtesy of Asheville Contemporary Dance Theater and owners Susan and Giles Collard. 
If you value the Overlook's place in Asheville's media landscape, please consider joining dozens of others who are supporting the show through my Patreon crowdfunding page. Become a member for as little as $5 a month. Visit patreon.com slash the Overlook podcast. Our first look newsletter gives you just a handful of daily headlines from around the local media landscape to get you on your morning. We also have a weekly newsletter devoted to all things The Overlook that hits you every Friday. Both are free and available at podavl.com slash newsletter. The theme song for The Overlook, Maker's Song, comes to us courtesy of the Asheville duo The Resonant Rogues. The Overlook is a production of Podcast Asheville. New episodes come out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on any social media channel at AVL Overlook. And I'll see you on the next episode of The Overlook with Matt Pikin. Hey everyone, Matt Pikin here with the Overlook Podcast. Did you know this is my full-time job? That's right, I left Asheville's public radio station to start this show from scratch. Now, I'm coming to you to help keep it going. This is my first fundraising campaign, and my goal? Reaching just $1,000 in monthly contributions. That's right, just $1,000 in monthly contributors by election day. That means you, listening right now, can make a big difference with your support. Membership starts at just $5 a month. Think about the difference the Overlook makes in your knowledge and engagement with the heartbeat of Asheville. Then take a moment and go to my Patreon crowdfunding page at Patreon dot com slash the overlook podcast help my show climb to one thousand dollars in monthly contributions today and thank you so much for your support